Hello, I'm Liam Fogarty, and my guest today has a really big job. First, she has to persuade some of the world's most in-demand artists to come to Liverpool. Then she has to find buildings and spaces for them to put their artworks in. And finally, she has to persuade people like you and me to come and see what's on offer. She is Sally Talent, and she's director of Liverpool Biennial. You're very welcome. Thank you. Just give us a beginner's guide to Liverpool Biennial. So uh, Liverpool Biennial is the UK Biennial of Contemporary Art. It's the largest visual arts festival in the UK. We had, in 2014, 877,000 visits to the Biennial. And we um, present art by artists from all over the world uh, in Liverpool, as well as incorporating exhibitions of Bloomberg New Contemporaries, which is um, recent graduates from UK-based art schools, and also the John Moore's Painting Prize, not to mention the enormous fringe, which is the independence. So it's a huge concentration of contemporary art all over the city. When you were approached to uh, apply for the job or, or asked to take up the job, um, what ran through your mind? No, I, I thought it was an amazing opportunity because um, pr prior to this, I was working in the Serpentine Gallery, which is a gallery in a park in London, in Kensington Gardens. And we did exhibitions and we commissioned architecture and I worked with communities beyond the constraints of the gallery and often used the park or the city. This is really the only job in the UK where I get the whole city. And I work with all the galleries, so the Tate, um, NML as much as, you know, if they want to participate, Blue Coat, Fact, um, the Art School, anybody who wants to take part with the work that we're doing. And so when else would you have the opportunity to do that? Plus, Liverpool uh, has a great history of engaging with contemporary art. And it's a city that has an appetite for new things and a place where I think things can happen that couldn't happen anywhere else. I mentioned that your job as director is um, talent spotting, I suppose. Mm. Um, you literally travel the world looking for artists who have work that would be suitable to show here and artists who want to come here and share in the biennial experience. Um, are you a bit like a kind of football manager looking for <laughs> star players? So I spent my career up until now working in galleries uh, and um, part of my job is to know as much as I can about what's happening in the world in relation to contemporary art. So um, in a way, knowing who is making really interesting work and finding the right moment for them to come to Liverpool. It could be that they're very young and it's an amazing opportunity just at the right moment in their career. It could be that they're incredibly established and that they're looking for an opportunity that we can only really offer in Liverpool. Or it could be someone who, you know, desperately wants an empty warehouse and we might have one. And um, do you have to sell the city as well as selling uh, the biennial as an event? People know Liverpool. I think it's funny, it's, um, I mean, often people know it because of the Beatles and football, but um, people also know it as a cultural context and a cultural destination. And, um, you know, it's the ninth edition of the biennial in 16. Um, and in that time, the biennial has achieved quite a high um, status within the international contemporary art context. So people really want to come here. And what we offer people is a situation really without constraints. So, you know, the conversation begins something along the lines of what, what would you like to do? And you've just come back from Venice, which oh, is the home yeah. of the original uh, yeah. biennial, uh, your lucky person. Um, there are a lot of biennials now around the world, aren't mm -hmm. there? Cities that want to kind of make a splash uh, in the creative uh, sector and in the visual arts. Is it getting harder, more competitive to bring the people you want to the Liverpool Biennial? Well, not really. There are millions of artists in the world that are making really interesting work as well. And I think that um, what we offer here is not the same as the biennial in Venice or the biennial in Moscow or the biennial in Mongolia, which there is. Um, there are about 200 biennials at the moment in the world. Um, some of them only ever do manage one edition because of the economic constraints or the, they're very precarious platforms. And uh, I'm part of, um, I'm on the board of the International Biennial Association and um, it's an incredible group of people. So um, I think that, you know, what biennials offer that galleries and museums often struggle to offer is the opportunity to make new work and to engage with a very specific place in the world. And so artists get very excited about doing that. As you say, the next edition in 2016 yeah. will be the ninth. Yeah. Um, 
Many of the previous ones have been very much in-your-face affairs. They've kind of plonked themselves in the middle of the city of Liverpool. Mm -hmm. They were quite literally unmissable. You kept bumping into works of art and installations and so on. Um, the last edition was criticised in some quarters for being much more, uh, much smaller, less visible. You know, it went up to the old um, uh, blind school uh, in, in Hardman Street. Do you think those criticisms were fair? I think it's the job of the critics to criticise. That's what they do. I kind of welcome feedback, but I, I think um, it wasn't smaller. Um, we worked with just as many artists and actually there were very large scale public realm works like the Dazzle Ship by Carlos Cruz Diaz down on the docks. We had major presentation at Tate and at Blue Coat. So um, I'm not sure. I think that um, it was a very serious biennial. We got a lot more press and we reached far higher kind of um, Mm, quality of feedback from our peers. So I think it was a more it was a more coherent biennial than in previous editions. And it did focus perhaps on, you know, we had a lot of artists inside the old blind school. For me, opening up a disused building is a public realm opportunity. So I think we're redefining what the biennial might mean in Liverpool. It'll be different next time. And of course, one of the jobs you have to do is to find spaces, find buildings that mm -hmm. will be free. Uh, for those months in 2016. Is that a bit of a, a bit of a bind? It's not easy. I mean, of course, we have an economic upturn in Liverpool. So um, this means that there are less buildings available in some areas. So, for example, in the Baltic. I mean, forget it. There's no empty space there now. And it's because fantastic. when Biennial started, yeah. the Baltic was empty, underused, yeah. unloved, unwanted, and, and, and you were in there. And there were two new cafes opening up just next week. So it's a really vibrant part of the city now. And, um, you know, with Liverpool One and the docks, it's, it's much more difficult to find buildings right in the heart of the city. Of course, around Castle Street, there are more empty venues. But, but who... Who, in, who would like to admit that their building will still be empty in 2016? So I'm in a constant, um, I'm like a, a, a property spotter. I've always got my eyes peeled for a building that someone else hasn't seen. Are you, are you a bit like, do you have to be a bit like a poker player too? A little bit, uh, a little Kind bit. of maybe making them an offer, like, yeah. mm, maybe not. Um, but in terms of the spaces, um, there are lots of empty buildings uh, around Liverpool still. Um, but is the real problem finding suitable ones that are safe and well lit and have all the amenities that mm -hmm. um, exhibition goers uh, would need as, as well as the artists? It's a combination of the history of the building themselves. So that might be something that an artist might, might, might want to, if an artist wanted to make a work about a bank, then we have various buildings that we could look at. Or um, it might be that the state of the building on the inside would just be prohibitive in terms of cost, in terms of renovating them or making them accessible to the public. Um, and it's not my job to renovate property. Uh, it's my job to present contemporary art. So we have to weigh up all the different odds, but really it's led by the artists. So for me, when artists visit the city, we, we spend a lot of time walking around with them and asking them questions about what they're interested in and that a lot of the proposals emerge from those conversations. So there's a match between the work and the artist and the, artists and yeah. the location. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you've mentioned uh, the difficulty of finding uh, suitable uh, premises. Uh, everybody who's involved in the public arts in the UK says the real difficulty at the moment is about finding money to stage these things. Um, are you going to have to be more modest? Are you going to have to kind of dial down your ambitions because of a, a lack of finance, say, from the public sector? Uh, no. I refuse to do that. So of course we're facing increased austerity, certainly with the recent election results. And, um, you know, it's, it is of concern that the ecology that's very hard earned in this country, um, that's, that's incredibly powerful and that, you know, that operates in rural areas and in all of our cities is under threat because not only is the cuts that will come directly through Arts Council to the arts sector are worried, but it's also the cuts that will come through local government inevitably over the next few years. So um, we will have to find new ways. So the reason my answer is no, is that I need to come up with new ways of funding projects. I refuse to reduce my ambition just because there isn't any money. 
Because the biennial has taken money from um, overseas governments and charitable course, foundations and individuals. So uh, how much of your job is simply fundraising? A lot. A lot of my job is fundraising. So once we have the artists and then we have an idea of what they want to achieve, then I need to find very generous individuals who want to help us do that. So can you guarantee the 2016 biennial will be as big and ambitious yeah. and successful as, as, its, as its predecessors? Uh, yes, and um, we're working towards an incredibly ambitious one in 2018, which will be our 20th anniversary as well. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. We'll talk about <laughs> those uh, biennials uh, when we come back after this short break. Thanks a lot. Welcome back. My guest today on Liam Fogarty Meets is Sally Talent, Director of Liverpool Biennial. Uh, Sally, we know the Biennial by its very name, uh, takes place every two years, mm -hmm. but you're very busy between biennials. Uh, you've mentioned the Dazzle Ship. What kind of stuff is going on between one biennial and another? So there's only two years between biennials, and actually there's only 18 months, because if you take into account when the biennial stops and when the next one opens, you've already used up half the time. Um, so we do lots and lots of talks and events and commissions between biennials in order to make sure that we use that time properly but also build our audiences so that they're confident when it comes to when it comes to the biennial suddenly arriving in town and also we have artists visiting all the time and it's really great for them to be able to do talks present their thinking to the world for people in liverpool to have the opportunity to kind of get to know them and think about what they might do in the city and we've We've heard about the Dazzle Ship, the Sir Peter Blake uh, collaboration, which has been a fantastic success. Everybody's, you know, dazzled. Very, but they're dazzled. They are. They are dazzled by it. But you have um, another installation uh, due mm -hmm. in in the heart of Liverpool, mm -hmm. in Everton, uh, sometime this year. Tell us a bit about that. So we're working um, with a Korean artist called Ku Jung Ah and also uh, a specialist organisation called Wheelscape, who um, are and it's a collaboration with the Friends of Everton Park, Liverpool Vision, Liverpool City Council to produce a wheels park in Everton Park. So at the base of the hill there, there's a kind of natural kind of amphitheatre space. And um, Ku's been working with young people from the Shrewsy and, the, and various skaters from the city to, to make a... Um, a skatable public artwork. So it's a it's a unique design. She's actually made one before in France, in Vassavière, which is a, a an island in France, which is and it uses this technology that means that it glows in the dark. So it's a fluorescing wheels park. And what she's made is incredibly beautiful. It's very large and it's got lots of different surfaces, and it will mean that people can both look at it as a kind of sculpture but also use it as an interactive space. And it can be used every day every by day. young people with the skateboards young, and the And, and older and people, if you want to have a go. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll have a think about yeah. that. <laughs> There's beginners areas for people that aren't that confident. Yeah. But is, is that part of uh, sending out a message that the biennial and what it represents mm. is for everyone? It's not yeah. just a kind of, mm. you know, elitist uh, activity. Well, I mean, art is part of our, of our lives and it should be. If all we ever do is go into shopping centres and consume um, the same produce um, produced by the same outlets in the same shops as in every other city in the world, and we think that we're being creative, how is that an interesting way to live? So through art, it's possible for people to engage with things that are maybe difficult, maybe a bit more challenging, but also um, to express their own thinking and ideas and not really just be consuming other people's ideas. So for me, it's really important that people engage with art, you know, not just bump into it, but actually engage with it as part of their daily activity. Does it annoy you, the phrase creative industries? Because so often artistic activity is judged by how much money it can bring in, how many tourists it can attract. Mm. And, you know, we talk about visitor numbers for Biennial and we talk about the value to the economy. But is that really a kind of add-on for you? Well, I think it's interesting because we are an employer and we do, you know, I can demonstrate um, that since 2004, and the only reason I can't go back any further is because we changed how we did our 
measuring, um, that we've brought um, 104 million pounds of economic impact to Liverpool. So it's not insignificant. And we do bring a, an enormous amount of tourists to the city, but more importantly, you know, we, um, last year I ran something called the City as a School and our mediation team, which is mostly young people from Liverpool, attended a school where they became real experts on the exhibition. They ran their own sessions and they, they are now the kind of legacy of the biennial. Hopefully they'll set up their own projects. They'll do their own things. So, you know, I know, you know, we all know that when you, when you experience extraordinary things, it changes your life forever. And do you find um, people come back to you months or years after a biennial mm. and say, do you know what, that actually mm. changed my mind, changed mm. my life, mm. it set me on a new career path? Does that kind of response ever happen? It does, and uh, it's amazing. I have people working in my team who began with us as interns many years ago and they've grown into jobs. But um, a good example of that is um, one of the guys painting Peter's ship uh, recently because he had to collaborate, of course, with the ship painters uh, from Camel Laird, he said um, that it had been the most amazing thing he'd ever been involved in in his life. That's amazing. And let's look ahead to 2016. Yeah. Um, are you able to say, hey, even at this early stage, <laughs> what kind of delights might be in store for us? Well, the thing about biennials is that they're very fast paced and reactive, which is a long, heart, long, long hand way of saying that we haven't got our list ready yet. Um, I'm working with a curatorial faculty, so I have a team of people around me who are helping us uh, think about what's needed. So I've got a curator, Raimundus Malachowskis from Lithuania. I'm working with Francesca Manacorda, who's the artistic director of Tate uh, in Liverpool here. Uh, Dominic Wilsden from San Francisco. Um, Francesco, Francesca Bertolotti, Rosie Cooper and myself from our team and, and, um, and Polly Brannan. And so together we've set up a kind of research group and we're looking into um, things that influence how we might think about how we consume culture. So we've been doing things as wide ranging as watching Family Guy, um, talking about Netflix box set episodes, thinking it about like episodic, episodic television structures <laughs> and, and we've been doing research into sites, yeah. but I'm not really ready to reveal anything yet. I'll come back and tell you when we are, but uh, not, not quite yet. But you were hinting at 2018, yeah. which will be the, the 10th. Um, can we expect something really, really special? I think it's a great opportunity to do things I haven't dared do before. So yes, 2018, you know, 20 years of a biennial, it's a big deal. And it's also uh, 10 years on from City of Culture here in Liverpool. So it is an opportunity to do something extraordinary. And um, I think the city's developing in a really interesting way. And I'm hoping that various areas of the city, which at the moment are a little bit off limits, will be a little bit more integrated to the infrastructure and ecology of the city by then. Let's talk about Liverpool. Um, mm. Your... Uh, not a Liverpoolian by birth, but I'm sure one by adoption uh, by now. Um, what could we do better as a city to encourage creativity, to showcase a creativity and get people involved? I think we do quite well. I think the city really embraces art and culture in a great way. What I'd like to see and what I hope we're working towards is that every school in this city has creativity at the heart of its curriculum. Because if we invest in the young people of Liverpool, we don't need to worry about the future. Um, you know, and ask, and, and you know, under recent governments, um, art and culture have really been removed from the curriculum. So it is really, really more and more important that we now spend time making sure that uh, our young people have the opportunity to engage with the very best culture in the world and, and that they engage with it regardless of whether their parents have an interest in art, that it's part of their everyday lives and part of what they learn at school. But there are lots of artistic organisations and, mm -hmm. and buildings and mm -hmm. enterprises in the city. Mm -hmm. um, do they communicate enough? Do we kind of punch our full weight creatively as, as a city and a city region? Well, you can always do more. And I would say we can always do more. Um, I, think, I think that Liverpool certainly is recognised as a, as a centre and is certainly acknowledged as the second largest cultural centre outside of London, which is amazing, I think, for a city with a relatively small population. 
And you, you, as I said, right at the outset, one of your tasks is to find locations, find buildings mm. that you can stage all mm. these exhibits in. And you've had to, you know, develop skills that maybe you never thought you had. Um, it's, it's very much a city centre based enterprise, isn't it? Isn't it a case for maybe finding new locations on the edge of the city centre, maybe over the water in Birkenhead or even further afield? I mean, it's been amazing working on the ferry because it strays from, the, it goes over to the other side. And um, obviously working in Everton Park, we're moving out of the city centre there. I think the, um, the thing that would make it possible is, is when the infrastructure in the city begins to join up a bit more. So once we have our road system sorted out, which is a proper challenge, as you know, um, then Everton Park can be better connected, let's say, to the city centre, that we can think about how some of the current um, the current roads that cut off areas of the city can maybe help to integrate those areas better. So, I mean, I'm working very closely, actually, with Liverpool City Council and thinking about how, uh, with really strategic commissioning, we might be able to uh, open up areas that are currently not open. And, and very briefly, there'll be people watching this programme who have maybe never been to a biennial, never sampled it. In 10 seconds, why should they go? Um, they should go to see things uh, that they would never, ever see in any other aspect of their lives. Sally Talent, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your company. We'll see you again soon.